So I'm here with Miguel Otero, a senior analyst for emerging markets at the Elcano Royal Institute. And Miguel just wrote um, a paper on, on the BRICS and the new bank, the new development bank uh, they have just uh, created. And so, Miguel, uh, what do you say or what do you mean by saying that uh, this is a game changer? Well, I, I put an interrogation mark as well. I say, is it a game changer? That's, that's, I think it's an open question still. But uh, I think it's interesting to look back. And uh, in 1944, in the Bretton Woods Conference, uh, the United States led uh, you know, to, uh, to, to, to building of um, uh, the World Bank and the IMF the two pillars of the Bretton Woods system that uh, lasted until 1971 with the Nixon shock, etc. But uh, we have still these two institutions, the World Bank and the IMF, which are, you know, financial development matters, are the multilateral institutions uh, par excellence. Um, and then we had uh, different waves of uh, regional development banks. We had uh, inter the Inter-American Development Bank in the 1950s. We had the Asian Development Bank in the 1960s. And then when the, the Berlin Wall uh, fell in 1989, we had as well the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And in all these different banks, uh, the United States was a founding member and so had a very important role and influence in the construction and management of these banks. And uh, so with this bank, this is the first bank essentially that is uh, not a Bretton Woods institution. It is uh, um, not a regional development bank because you have five members from four different continents. So it's a, a truly global multilateral bank. And on top of that, uh, what is interesting is that um, the United States, it's not a founding member. So this is the first international multilateral development bank that uh, where the United States is not uh, a founding member. And on top of all of this, what is interesting is that um, this is really the first attempt by China to be leading uh, the construction of uh, international organization that is multilateral in its in its essence in its construction and this is very interesting because china up to now was always kind of a bit of a passive uh, actor in uh, multilateralism and you see here that uh, china took a very active role in creating this bank and that's i think significant so it has all these elements make the new development bank uh, uh, have the potential to be a game changer in the um, international economic order. And do you think that this uh, new development bank is a real alternative to the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund? Well, I, I don't really like to see it as uh, alternatives or rival institutions. I think it's complementary. Uh, I mean, and th this is still, a, a, I mean, a, a bank that has to be built yet. So it's difficult to foresee, you know, how it will work. But um, what is clear is that um, mm, uh, there are a couple of elements that um, point uh, to the necessity of having this bank. One is that uh, emerging markets, uh, and uh, emerging powers like China, India, Brazil, etc., they feel that they are underrepresented in the IMF and the World Bank. And they have asked to have more voice and influence in these institutions. And in 2010, uh, the board of the IMF decided that uh, they should get more votes, more uh, voice in the, in the uh, decision making. Uh, of these institutions, but uh, the United States Congress so far has blocked the ratification of this agreement in 2010. So these uh, countries have been waiting for four years to have more say in the Bretton Woods institutions and they have discovered that uh, they didn't get it and they haven't got it and therefore uh, they feel the need to create an institution where they have a role to play. Uh, and they have their saying uh, and their influence. Um, on top of that, um, um, this bank is going to be focusing mostly uh, on uh, infrastructure. And in the world, there is uh, a need for financing, funding of the, uh, a lot of infrastructure projects, especially in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, in you know, developing uh, countries. And uh, so far, 
um, um, some studies have shown that we need uh, roughly two trillion dollars per year to fund these projects. But overall, the multilateral system that we have right now, uh, both you know with pu public and private uh, funding, uh, gets to one trillion. So there's a one trillion dollar gap that needs to be filled and so therefore the new development bank could be potentially uh, just complementary to the World Bank and to the IMF and to the regional development banks. So I think it's just another piece in the global puzzle of multilateralism. And why would you say that China is going to have better power at least uh, de facto? Well, yeah, I think, I think here, you know, the, the important uh, point to make is that de facto it might, it might become, potentially, um, de jure or kind of, uh, you know, under the agreements, uh, all the five members have the same voting power. They have put uh, all of them 10 billion, uh, or they will put 10 billion dollars in the subscribed capital. Uh, so it's going to be 50, uh, 50 billion uh, altogether. So um, formally, all of them have the same voting power. But of course, we have to see that China uh, is the biggest economy of these five economies. Uh, it is actually one and a half times uh, the GDP of the other four combined. Uh, and so, and now we have as well seen that it uh, has achieved to put the headquarters in Shanghai, which you know shows that China will have uh, you know big influence in the decision making of this uh, institution. And uh, I mean, it has the funds, it has the money, it has four trillion uh, dollars in, in foreign reserves. So whenever this bank might become big and have you know, larger uh, projects to fund, etc. Uh, China, I think, will play always a very important role. Uh, and so I, I cannot see that uh, any decision uh, of, uh, you know, of importance will be decided without the consent uh, of China. And, and so therefore, I think China, in, especially in big projects, in, in big decisions, they, they will have veto power. I don't think that the others will push forward any project. Uh, without uh, having China on board. And do you think that the asymmetry between China and the other BRICS would be a problem? I mean. uh, this is to be seen. Uh, I think potentially could be. Of course, uh, the United States was the overwhelming power when the Bretton Woods institutions were created. Uh, it had 50% of uh, gold reserves. It had veto power de facto and de jure in the Bretton Woods institutions. I mean, hegemonic stability theory tells you as well that you might need a hegemon, you might need a leader in an institution, and uh, you might have to, some followers. It's to be seen whether the arrangement will be like that and that, uh, you know, Brazil and India and South Africa and Russia are happy to follow uh, China in this institution because China is the biggest economy and the most powerful country of those. Or whether, you know, we have a more uh, egalitarian regime where uh, everyone has its say, uh, where the president, that as you know, the, the, the the first president will be an Indian official, whether he or she will have the room of maneuver to take decisions uh, autonomously, independently. Um, I mean, this is an interesting uh, experiment because we will see how uh, an institution that was essentially created by China uh, can function as a truly multilateral institution or whether it will be just a tool for China to achieve its goals. And as you say, the new development bank's headquarters will be in Shanghai, but China will not chair the, the, this new bank until at least the next four two decades. And do you think this is an attempt to uh, balance the, the, the power sharing between its members? Well, I, th I think I think it uh, can be seen as a concession. I think, uh, you know, uh, th this is very interesting, of course, because I mean, at the end of the day, this is the first time where you have officials from these five countries coming together on a regular basis. I mean, uh, in Fortaleza, Brazil, we had the sixth summit. So this is the first time that you have officials from these countries where you don't have officials from the United States. So you have, a, a, you know, a very kind of new setting where you know there's a different power play going on uh, and uh, therefore um, we'll have to see but i think the negotiations have shown that uh, you know 
these countries at the end of the day can reach some consensus. And I think uh, it is a give and take. And uh, China got to Shanghai headquarters. And for that maybe to happen, they had to uh, uh, concede um, not being chair in this bank uh, for the next uh, 20 years because it's on a rotating presidency and China will get the last presidency. So this is true. So, but this comes back to, to my previous question, whether China will allow the chairs of this bank set in Shanghai to take independently their decisions, uh, their autonomy. And given the situation and the fact that the U.S. are losing power, uh, what do you think, what is the role of the European Union? Well, I think this is interesting. I mean, uh, um, I mean with this bank, um, as I said, these countries show their discontent with the current framework. Uh, and that uh, they want to have more influence. And uh, of course, uh, uh, because there is a stalemate in the IMF regarding the voting powers, uh, there is the threat that these countries will create parallel institutions. Uh, and this might be uh, jeopardizing the previous Bretton Woods uh, framework. Uh, and there is as well a sense that um, um, things just can go uh, business as usual, that we had a global financial crisis, but uh, that uh, the United States and Europe slowly are recovering from the crisis, and that uh, we have to change just a few things in the bread and butter institutions, but not really um, change dramatically the structures of the system. And I think this shows that uh, you know there is a willingness by a lot of emerging market, financial, business, political elites to uh, to change the system considerably and uh, and therefore uh, Europe needs to see where it wants to stand if it all the time you know sides with the United States in trying to block the ascendancy or the emergence of these uh, countries and, and 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 giving up I mean blocking the giving up of more power to these countries then you, you could see a, a, a uh, configuration of power blocks, uh, the kind of you know the West against the rest, so to speak, and I think that would be dangerous. So I think Europe. Uh, I finish you know my my paper by saying that Europe will continue to be the junior partner of the United States, but I think that does not preclude it. Uh, that doesn't shouldn't stop it to uh, to be kind of a broker that understands both sides and that uh, can you know, be an important player in this transition that we are seeing, which is a power shift essentially from the West to the rest, especially China. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.